even my biological dental friend said, hmm, when they heard that a 76 year old could see substantial um, recession diminution. You know, there's that old expression, I, I wrote it long in the tooth. Long in the tooth is a silly thing. Your teeth don't elongate, your gum shorten. So long in the tooth is an expression for aging and aging not that well, by the way. But really it's, it's you know, there's a number of different markers out there. I, I saw someone this morning that did a true diagnostic test and his uh, age is 66, but his true diagnostic age is 60. Gum recession might be another sort of barometer. And it, it's important to understand who this gentleman is. He's someone I've been working with now for almost a couple of years, maybe two years plus, and he has some different things going on that we're working on. And, and you know, we, we take two steps forward, one step backwards. We took a couple of steps backwards and step forward. But overall, I think he's feeling pretty good right now. Um, but the thing about Robert as a retired, retired gentleman at the age of 76, is he's very methodical about recording information. So lung volume, boy, did he record his lung volume. We we're watching that tra traipse its way up from a fairly low, below where he should be for his age to where he should be for his age. Blood pressure, very meticulous about the analytics and recording it. So when Robert tells me something, that something has either got worse or got better, there may be subjectivity to it in terms of how he feels, but he also documents things very objectively. So when he wrote to me about a month ago about this change, I was very excited about it. So he said, my name is Robert, I'm 76 years old. Please see the accompanying periodontal ex exam graphs, which I'm not an expert at, but will highlight the key things. Um, so the original and last two of the actual exam charts are included for reference and validation. They're in here. I will publish this if he gives me permission to, unless he thinks I botched it. But this is what he wrote to me. My first exam was on May 2011, so 11 years ago. Um, there was advanced periodontal disease. It shows some fives, some fours, no ones. And this we're talking, I think it's millimeters of recession of the gum. So five millimeter is pretty substantial. Um, from advanced periodontal disease to completely normal, um, my last exam in August of 2022, number 11 on the graph shows zero fours and 22 ones. It's a dramatic turnaround, okay? So from advanced periodontal disease to completely normal, although this took 11 years, most of the improvement in the number of number ones occurred in the time between the last two exams, a period of six months. So even though he's been fastidious about this and working at it, he's seeing the, the greatest improvement. So I would suggest from a log linear perspective, some of the things he was doing previously have been helpful, but what he's done most recently has tipped him over the top. And so we'll go over that in a second. And hopefully I can get my printer to stop. So I attribute this, and what he means this is the most recent results in the last six months to the introduction of dioxy rinse in November of 2021, used once daily in the morning. I can, it can be used twice daily uh, in the morning and at night. And I've had these bottles on my, um, on my counter, my bathroom counter now for about five months. And I will say that my bathroom counter has experienced no change in recession. But myself, we don't know. So this morning, I tried it for the very first time. And we'll go over the protocol. And I got the same effect with this that I got with a pharmaceutical I use now and again to clean my teeth. And it almost feels like you've been to a hygienist. You know, when you rub you bend to the hygienist and they scrape all the tartar away and you rub your tongue on the back of your teeth and you kind of feel the ridges in one session i'm beginning to feel 
like my mouth is already cleaner. Maybe it's the placebo nocebo effect, but Roberts is not. So my charting. So we see original exam. And then this is the amount of recession, 12 to one. Um, so we're seeing a good amount of improvement in, in our numbers. And this is the most profound one where we have 16 is new. Uh, it went from what, Robert? A very large number to zero in terms of the recession scale in that tooth. And he's had different hygienists, the same hygienist over different times. I don't have the exact timeline on that, but he feels that from an objective perspective, and it's not hard to measure recession. You know, you can tell where the gum should be and you measure in, in millimeters. So it's it's not something that's that requires fine, fine tooling. So, so 23 better, uh, 11 or worse, but they're not bad compared to the ones that have improved. Um, let's see here. More data, which just kind of shows uh, the number of improvements. I really can't read this and I'm not going to attempt to, but um, overall we're seeing improvement. This is this is the key thing, and I thank Robert for this because otherwise I have to read these charts. But what he says, 511, 911, he's seeing a dramatic reduction in the number of fours. Okay. Um, 511, 12 fours, one five. Okay. So we're just seeing an overall improvement in that. And so this is the product that he's used. If you're not familiar with that, and we'll go over the protocol in, in a second, but I give you the link Frontier Farm. There may be other sources, but this is the source I believe Robert got it from. So frontierfarm.com. And um, let's see, oops. I will try to put this in the chat, but right now I'm stuck in a mode where I can't copy it. So what is, yes, sir. Let's see if I can find, um, find and put it into the chat. So. There it is, oops. So there we go. And they have a bunch of things but I believe he's just using the one product. So let me see if I can find my chat. There we go. Yes, okay, we have uh, we have it out there and I'll give you the full link. Good. So next. So the oxy rings, Rinse is basically chlorine dioxide, which was covered in a Zoom meeting. Uh, we talked about it with David Harshfield. We talked about it with Dr. Ronier. So we've had a couple, and, and there's some stuff published out there on that, but we didn't necessarily go into the specificity of how to use it for oral care. And I think, but I don't have proof of this, that at the concentration you're making it in this dioxy rinse, you don't go all the way to chlorine dioxide or you go, you get very little chlorine dioxide. I think what you're really getting is chlorous acid, chlorous acid. And, you know, hypochlorous acid is used to treat the skin to reduce wrinkles. We think it's treating a, a, a mite, an under the skin mite in doing that. Um, hypochlorous acid is used to nebulize uh, and spray to uh, clean up barriers against infection like SARS-CoV-2. And then your gut has hydrochloric acid, which is a much, much stronger acid. So I think this is what we're really producing here. Um, so which is covered in the Zoom meeting. It's convenient two bottle product. One bottle is solution sodium chloride and the second bottle is citric or lactic acids. So these are actually very weak acids. That's why I don't think we're producing chlorine dioxide that requires a stronger acid. I think we're producing the chlorous acid. So what you do is you take 
bottle A and B. This is what Robert got. Um, three pumps of each into, I just put it in a shot glass and then I let it sit to activate. It takes a little while for that sodium chloride to can be converted to the acidic form. Um, so the active ingredient. So Robert says on their listing is you get 200 ppm of the chlorine dioxide. But you know when I make up the chlorine dioxide as a treatment is I feel um, you can really smell the chlorine type odor where this, this you can't whatsoever. You swish this for 30 seconds, then gargle it for another 15 seconds, then you spit it out. The other products are available. Uh, okay, so this is this is the main thing he's doing once a day in the morning. Um, this is the only substantial change that was in effect during the six months between the last two exams to my oral hygiene regime. And that's where he saw the most profound improvement in his recession. Having two root canals, so other things he's done, very important, had two root, root canal teeth pulled and replaced with implants. One should opt for implants and not have a root canal done in the first place. Thank you, Robert, I agree. The other was taking half of, should be these, I think, Baja Gold Salt. We had that lecture by our gentleman that uh, is carrying on the torch for Maynard Murray. He began that in December of 2021, brush three times a day, uh, but only eat two meals a day with intermittent fasting, use a water pick three times a day. And I will tell you that the people who water floss, hydrofloss, water pick multiple times a day, when we do the oral DNA testing, tend to have the lowest burden by far. So I know it's not necessarily that convenient to be doing that three times a day, but I think that's even better than brushing three times a day. So if you're brushing twice a day, water floss the same number of times. He makes his homemade toothpaste combination of baking soda, sea salt, and a little xylitol. Um, I've also adopted two of my programs, putting the povidone iodine into his water pick. Uh, could be done, you know, he's just doing it once a week. The iodine is... Um, able to penetrate biofilms. If it's brown, it's elemental iodine, diatomic molecules, so it's neutral. It can penetrate into biofilms and it's an, a very strong antiseptic. And so he also does, and this came from my mentor, Dr. Tremp, uh, he will put, he will have a saturated sea salt solution. And then I assume either dip his toothbrush in it uh, but you can brush with this as well. I'm, I'm brushing with straight up salt. Salt, preserved meat. It's an anti, antibacterial. So it's a good thing. My mentor told me that as an ophthalmologist, he looked at everybody's teeth too. And the, when people were quite old and had really good gums, he asked them what, what they did. And very frequently, I'm not sure what percentage of the time, the older folks that were brushing with salt had the best gums. Um, and I think it's never one thing. So we're going at it from multiple perspectives. You know, Tom Levy talks about hydrogen peroxide daily. I don't think that's the best advice. I work with a number of nurses and the nurses always tell me that when you put peroxide on a wound one time, okay. But if you keep applying it, it slows healing. We think we think that peroxide is a little too aggressive against good organisms as well as bad organisms. And you have a microbiome on your skin and your mouth and your gut. So if you insist on peroxide, my recommendation is no more than once a week. Now, Tom Lockensgard told me that the biofilm when you do a thorough cleaning doesn't come back for a few days. It starts aggregating into tartar essentially it starts off as a slimy film that then aggregates kind of like the barnacles on the shore you, know, you go down by the shore side uh, you know ocean side like in uh, booth bay harbor and it's all slippery and slimy well that eventually will form into those solid barnacle structures okay so the same thing happens so it could be that he could have got the same results by doing the dioxin rinse once or twice a week 
rather than daily because of the way the biofilm reforms. Okay, particularly if you go and get a dental hygiene visit, then you probably don't, you know, you get everything cleared out and you probably don't have to do it every day. But I'm just going to, you know, we're, we're in unknown territory and I'm trying to balance between anti-infective and your microbiome because your best daily antibiotic is your probiotics in your system. So that's important. Um, other than using the dioxin rinse uh, once daily, I have no other reason to account for the dramatic improvement in my periodontal health. And, uh, you know, I thank him very much for sharing this information and allowing me to share. I would have had him present, but he's uh, not necessarily there with a computer, even though he's listening today. Um, I, I want to, I'm writing this chapter on oral health and I've almost finished. And I want to just cover a couple things. And I think even though I always promise to do things and sometimes don't necessarily fall through with it, I'm going to put out excerpts from my oral chapter in pieces because, you know, I'm reading Tom Lockensgard's book, which isn't published yet, called Matters of the Mouth. And what I'm writing is very different. So it's like, we, we do not have saviors out there for us in the traditional world. So here's my alma mater, MIT. And this is the very beginning of my my oral chapter book, uh, oral chapter in the book, Health Freedom Lost. And I have the McGovern Institute for Brain Research. Spent a lot of time trying to talk to those people. The Pekawa Institute for Learning and Memory. I spent a lot of time talking to those folks. Me and Dr. Tramp, Dr. Burke presented on what we're doing. Some of Judith McClosey's work, which I'll show you in a minute, which I've shown in the past, but... Um, don't miss Brian Balin's talk coming up in a in a month or so because he is an expert on brain health related to organisms similar to the oral organism, which is why I'm talking about this. So we told them that we think we have a better, a, a complementary, not a better approach to what they're trying to develop. And McGovern funded this to the tune of 1.2 billion. And I don't know what the Pacawa budget is. But here's Paul Gray, one of the most beloved chancellors, presidents of MIT's history. And here he is with Alzheimer's. So I, I read with sadness about three years ago that Paul Gray died after a, a long battle with Alzheimer's disease. Probably had it when Dr. Burke and I were, were talking to these folks, to crickets, by the way. You know, they have their agenda. My mentor at... Um, no, my, not my mentor by a long man, long stretch. My advisor at MIT was the youngest chaired professor in their history. And then he went on to be chancellor at um, Washington University in St. Louis. And I called him one day after reading something from the medical school at Wash U and what they were doing. And I said, Mark, you guys are heading in the wrong direction. And he goes, well, we have a few molecules in... Uh, in the pipeline it's like a molecule huh never going to help you with alzheimer's you know um it, it's a holistic approach so this is what you're going to get from some of the top thinkers i mean my mentor graduated caltech in two years and four months youngest full professor i wish he would do something real but now he's retired so what am i going to do um so anyway what i want to show you right now is hopefully where to go used to be up here but uh, that's not it we want to i just want to show you you know what happens when you're in the wrong space at the wrong time and this is a dear friend of mine judith mcclosey out of switzerland md phd and what she showed in 1993 is that spirochetes can cause Alzheimer's. And she's published probably 40 papers on this, proving it, Koch's hypothesis, and all, all different criteria to show not just an association, which she showed here, but a causal relationship. And why do I bring this up? When you're, re when you're reducing recession in your gums, you're reducing gingivitis. When you have gingivitis, I was listening to Dr. Barubi's talk that she did on our channel 
a few months ago. And I, I recommend anybody that anybody should go to the blog and and type in oral and uh, listen to that again because it's quite brilliant. But Almost everyone with a little gum recession has some gingivitis. And if you have gingivitis, there's a good chance you have periodontal disease comorbid with it. And many of the organisms are spirochetal in nature. So, you know, in Britain, the number one cause of early mortality now is, is Alzheimer's. In Thailand, the number two is Alzheimer's. We need to take care of our teeth. Okay. Really, really important. And so that's a major cause. Let's see what else I have here. Just some highlights from what I'm what I'm writing in the in the book slide. So away from the current slide. And I'll try to wrap this up shortly. You know, Ohio State University, I, I like it when a big university has a viable website that goes into conspiracy theories. So this is the end of the quote on fluoride. I know everybody wants to avoid fluoride. Um, I'm trying to dig into what it's what it really is and where the what the what the research is saying about fluoride. There's no question it hardens your teeth. There's no question. Okay, but is that a good thing? Fosamax hardens bones. Okay, for people that women that do the bone density scan or even men and you get take Fosamax and it hardens the bone, but it also makes them more brittle and they catastrophically break much more easily. So it's hardening it the right way to go. So what the Ohio State University concludes is in all likelihood, the only significant problem that would arise from the end of fluoridation is that the Florida phosphate industry would have to find a different way, no doubt a more expensive and less convenient one to dispose of toxic waste fluoride fluoride compounds but instead we're putting that in water okay so there's a, a link to that a very good treatise on fluoride if if you're interested or you want to start a campaign to get the fluoride of water it makes no sense we know someone dr carter you may not know that we know someone through mike weiner that was the gentleman that proposed that they put statin drugs in water you know so there you go um and what I love about the conclusions made about fluoridation is the optimal dose is one part per million. Isn't that an unusual number? I wonder how they got there. Doesn't sound very scientific to me, and it, indeed it's not. Um, so here's Dr. McClosey. We talked about that. So, you know, like simple questions Are, are our teeth made of fluoride? Are our teeth created to be strong and last a lifetime? Yeah, before processed food and and like the USDA fund, funds junk food rather than healthy food, things like that. Then shouldn't we support our bodies with the nutrients to rebuild our teeth with what they are composed? Okay, so here's a, a nice little uh, link to a dentist. So why are we not augmenting the, the water and toothpaste with these calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium? Now, calcium can be a problem, but really what we have going on in, in calcium is a boron deficiency, magnesium deficiency, vitamin D deficiencies, things like that. So we probably can, we get a lot of calcium. Critical, critical to the life cycle of every plant and animal. So it's, it's ubiquitous. If you're eating well, you're taking in plenty of calcium. Um, now we'll just go over you know, Dr. Berube in her talks is there's a wide variety in the quality of biological dentists. Um, but, you know, the traditional dentists, most of them will not really reach the, the level of below the gum care that a biological dentist will achieve. So, you know, this is what biological dentistry deals with, identify infections of the teeth, but not just in the teeth. Bone is particularly troublesome. If that root canal is allowed to linger and it infects the bone, you can remove the tooth, but you can't remove the bone. So you're still going to have ongoing potential spirochetal infection. That's why removing root canals sooner than later is probably the best course of action because it's not just the infection is not just sitting there in the tooth and you pull it out and 99% of it came with you. 
understanding heavy metal toxicity, appreciating what's going on below the gum line and using techniques better than a two-dimensional x-ray. You really should get an oral DNA or other tests and a three-dimensional x-ray. Anybody over 50, anybody has any particularly memory brain complaints. Um, organ meridians to identify teeth organ connections. They're pretty clear. I don't know them, but Tom has discussed them with me and how he uses them to interview his oral patients for systemic conditions. Helping people overcome sleep apnea and sinus issues by dealing with oral pathogens. Why do we suddenly in society have a CPAP device deficiency? Now, it's really, it's really coming from the mouth so many, so many, so many cases, not always. But you know, I have a testimonial from this lady that had slightly elevated white blood cell counts, no root canals, and found out she had infection under, under a crown. It was pushing into her sinuses. Choosing the best biocompatible materials, uh, using the oral inflammatory connection, doing proper testing, looking at white blood cell counts and C-reactive protein, understanding the role of proper nutrition, and proper nutrition doesn't mean just taking some fluoride thing. I know when I was uh, naive, and I turned it down anyway, that they gave me something, my gums were receding, and um, had a cavity or two, and they gave me concentrated fluoride. I'm saying, hmm, how does that help with receding gum? But the American Chemical Society says it may actually help with some of the bacteria in the mouth. So maybe it does, but not the best choice. Um, this is really important. You know, a lot of children today have issues with chewing, with headaches, things of, of that nature. And you know, the Weston A. Price study on jaw structure, very critical. And there are great testimonials from their Weston A. Price Foundation as, as to when we fix the structure of the jaw that some health problems can resolve as well. It's not just about pulling an infected tooth. Understanding pH, um, the osteoporosis, periodontal connection, bone eater. Um, bone eater. So osteoporosis, you're losing bone density. Oops. Let me get on with, um, compare this to what a regular dentist does, routine cleaning, two-dimensional x-ray, recommend root canals, remove mercury off without appropriate safeguards, give samples of fluoride containing toothpaste and promote fluoride. Uh, yeah, what I found is when recession of cavities are noted, they might recommend more dental visits, but they gave me a higher higher fluoride containing toothpaste. Give a little advice on gingivitis and periodontal disease at its earliest stages because they just comply with the ADA. Yeah. Uh, preventing cavities with a lost, potentially lost customer. Here's Dr. Tom's protocol for home oral care that he calls how to clean your teeth naturally. Oil pulling. You can use sesame oil or coconut oil. Coconut oil contains lauric acid. The coconut oil itself being um, Non-polar can penetrate biofilms. Lauric acid is somewhat of an antibiotic. Um, you know, to maintain good pH, rinse with water. You may not be able to brush, but drink and, and rinse with water to give your, let your physiology set the pH rather than, you know, if, if I have a buffered pH of 7.4 in my blood and then I'm taking in a lot of acidic drinks, it's going to take a while for that pH to go back up to slightly alkaline in the mouth, you know, and you want alkalinity to prevent bacterial growth. Uh, drink a full glass of pure water with a small amount of sea salt daily and fresh squeezed lemon juice. Robert's doing that with his uh, Baja Gold. Add back the minerals uh, and just continually drinking mineralized water. So I, I have a salt that I make up with, um, sodium, potassium, magnesium. And um, then I take this one daily, but there are other there are others. I think we've talked about that before. A fulvic, humic, mineral mixture. 
get the trace nutrients. Very important to do that. I take a capful a day, nothing, nothing major. Um, more. Tom likes the Sonicare, the ultrasound one rather than the uh, the rotary one. You can make up uh, baking soda, coconut oil, and peppermint paste yourself. Chew gum, um, or if you chew gum and must eat sugar, then xylitol. What I what I learned from um, Karen Kishnan of Microbiome Labs is that if you're chewing gum, you're sending a response for hunger. So you know, chew, chewing gum may be a good way to you know, entertain yourself and pre prevent from eating, but it actually does just the opposite potentially. Um, consume sufficient anti-inflammatory foods, cod liver oil and fish oil. Now we know we have to eat fish three times a day, uh, three times a week, and take some supplementation and fish oils to get our EPA blood level up to uh, eight percent or more. Taking boron and silicon compounds that support the parathyroid hormone, thus calcium balance. Your teeth are mostly calcium phosphate. So Mercola has a very good blended boron product called Bone Restore or Bone Something, which contains small amounts of boron, probably adequate. Um, oops. And then Tom says, I have a crazy friend who wrote a book that brushes with pure lye soap. As hard as that seems, the soap helps remove biofilms and it's also alkaline like baking soda. So it's a very inexpensive alternative to toothpastes. Toothpaste. If you make a toothpaste at home, add a touch of essential oil, especially clove and thieves oil. Of course, never use traditional toothpaste, especially those with fluoride. That crazy friend, of course, is me. Um, floss with water and string tape daily. Avoid using aggressive antipathogenic additives like peroxide. If you have... Um, Ooh, bad, bad case of gingivitis, used peroxide really may help, rarely may help, but it also destroys the oral biofilm necessary for healing. So add iodine or salt into the water floss or tank. And this is the lady that said, you know, underlying infection of some kind revealed by white blood cell counts. And then she did the myperiopath and found out that she had modest to high levels of oral pathogens. And then she got the scan and they found the infection under tooth 15. Crazy considering I've had zero pain in that tooth of sinus. That's why, you know, um, the, oral, the oral test is a way to tell that there's something going on and, and take, take some action. Let's not, let's not wait in this area. Put it. This is true preventative dentistry. And let's see. Do you have a C? This is my sarcasm written in the book. Do you have a CPAP deficiency, machine deficiency? So, you know, could it be that somewhere along our evolutionary development, we lost the attachment of this machine to our head? Okay, a little sarcastic, but my brother, he he gets free medical care being a military vet. You know, so whatever his VA doc tells him, so he happily wears a CPAP. And now you better clean that thing because you'll get bacteria in that and it's nasty. But according to orthodontics of Texas, people with obstructive sleep apnea are more likely to struggle with moderate to severe periodontitis, chicken and the egg syndrome here. But they're even more likely to develop whatever this stuff is, TMJ, T TMD disorders. And that is not from the CPAP machine or the sleep apnea. That's from destruction of the bone. In my opinion, this statement is the cart before the horse. That is, they have the periodontal disease for a long period of time, and the 2D, 2D x-ray is not adequate to articulate where they are on that bone loss continuum. Um, so Dr. Tom is writing his book. It's not published yet, Matters of the Mouth. He explains uh, sleep, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, one of the most important topics of dentistry today is oral fascial myology. Um, so this is something, if you have children with, with jaws way out of whack, grandchildren, probably want to get that investigated because it can have long-term health consequences. I know my middle daughter, you know, her, her mouth was very much disformed, braces, very narrow. 
And she has a lot of health issues that we're slowly working through. I'm not a doctor, so it's like, she's kind of traditional, likes to work with a doctor. But anyway, um, and this is Dr. Barubi. I really recommend you go on our blog and it's and rewatch that video. Whether you have an oral issue or not, it's a great insurance policy. So you just go to healthyrevivalpartners.com and our, click on the blog and just put in oral in the search, or you can just use this link. I see many patients that have had heart attacks and the physicians didn't know why it occurred. The oral DNA test can be very illuminating. This is but one tool that can be used for diagnosis, or other simple methods that can be employed by any clinician or obtaining a HSCRP, white blood cell count with HRC, HSCRP, uh, evaluating hemoglobin A1C, reasonable. I mean, sugar promotes having ample sugar the bacteria love that, and of course, vitamin D. Uh, so let's see where we are. And with that, that's all we have for today. Um, but you know, I think what what Robert did is extraordinary. Tom Lockensgard, one of the most well-known and certainly the most loved biological dentist, such a sweetheart of a human being. I showed him these results and his response was, hmm, it's just not occurring, you know, in the general population whatsoever. And, you know, I think Robert's conclusion is right that the deoxy rinse had a major push at pushing him over the top and getting the tissue will, will rebuild. You have blood, if you have blood flow, there's a good chance that you can restore whatever has been lost. We see that in Alzheimer's and any disease that reverses. Blood flow and tissue repair is part of it. And your gums are part of this whole process. So there's no question that, um, that the result, anecdotal as Robert admits it is, as a one-off, is something that can be done. Now, I have a, a consult with a gentleman who water flosses six times a day. And his first oral DNA pegged zeros on all 11 pathogens, zeros, no indication. And no one else has even come close to that. There have been some good results. And then he said, well, what if I stop doing six a day? And um, I don't know exactly how he changed his oral protocol, but then we, we ran it. I said, you don't have to run it again, but he wanted to run it. And there was just a little blips of some of the organisms i can't remember exactly what they were but you know so if you clean well even if there's something down below you're you're kind of like vacuuming some of that junk out and you know you're certainly not challenging your gut with those organisms because if we're detecting it in the saliva and you're swallowing a liter and a half of saliva a day guess where those pathogens are going and so they can potentially get into your bloodstream if you don't have adequate stomach acid to snuff them out. So even though it's a saliva test, we're not grabbing a sample from below the gum line. There's a very good correlation between periodontal disease concentration down there and what we see in the saliva above, but it's more, more to it than just the saliva. So we have, we have, um, so sadly, the ingredients include things like saccharin. Yeah, you know, you can you can make your own. I mean, <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you how, but you can get pure sodium um, chloride, and you can get the acids that they use to activate it. And I'm sure somewhere out there is a formula to make the equivalent, but see, you're not swallowing the stuff. So maybe everything has a risk benefit analysis, right? Certain things with no risk that don't, that don't have a benefit aren't doing anything for you anyway. So, but it's all natural, whatever. So you gotta look at the risk benefit analysis. And if your oral DNA test is bad or you had root canals or things like that, then doing this once in a while may not be a bad thing. We have a thumbs up. We have a thumbs up, or is that a question? 
And if you have a question and you want to come off of um, the mute, help yourself, because I don't think I'm preventing anybody. I have a request. If you could put Dr. Tom's protocol back up, I was writing down some of the steps while you're answering other questions. We can do that. That'd be awesome. Thank you. And I'll remute myself. Thanks. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, do you, uh, did, did that man have abscesses? Um, no, I don't believe, I don't believe they were that to that extent, just recession. Okay. And then how do you deal with the, um, so when you find the spirochetes, is there a, a treatment for the spirochetes? There is. Now I won't go into that, but we're going to have a couple people on in the next month or two that will talk about it. You know, um, my approach is antibiotic. Dr. Carter's approach is more, more natural. Um, you know, I would have to refer you to, to a MD to go down that path. And Dr. Carter might, may or may not do that. It all depends on budgetary concerns and where you are on the spectrum of pharmaceuticals versus natural things. But, you know, Lyme disease, you know, these, these are in the chronic phase and they can go into different forms and hide. So it, no matter what you do, it's not gonna be a short-term treatment. But the most important thing you can do is turn the spigot off and that's the mouth. Mm -hmm. You might've got a tick bite 40 years ago, like I did, and, and then something cropped up later under a situation of vulnerability, but the source was long gone. And so you can potentially manage that. But if you have an ongoing source, it can only go in one direction, get worse. Mm. Okay. So that, that's a consideration there. But there, there are a number of things. You can look up you know, treatments for spirochetes. They're not uncommon. Lyme protocols, Jay Davidson and folks like that develop the cell core program for that and other things which Dr. Carter implements. So okay. lots of choices. I don't like going into treatment on these on these because we like oh, yeah. where your portfolio is. Okay. Pam, I'll move to the other page on Tom's protocol. So there we go. Um, Thank you. Let's see. I wish you did BIH or have someone on your program talk about that. Don't know what that is, but I can make up an acronym for it. Um, I would love if your service offered nutritional baseline testing as a precursor to the, you know, Dr. Carter's can do that, but see, I'm not dissuading you from going there, but in my humble opinion, nutritional deficiencies can be solved with some of the things we put into our report that everybody gets nutrient density, but then fixing gut. You know, it's very clear homocysteine can go up, lack of B vitamins, but lack of absorption of B vitamins, um, things like that. So in my humble opinion, if you want to get nutritional testing, it's going to add some cost, which I'm trying to avoid initially, but go the Dr. Carter way. I'm all, I'm all in on that because his depth and breadth of knowledge is superior to most people, even in the functional world. Okay. However, Let's fix gut first and then do the nutritional testing because if you're nutrient deficient, guess what we're going to do? Work on the gut, not give you extra supplements for those specific minerals right out of the chute kind of thing. So that, that's philosophically why we don't do that first. I'm trying to keep it as, you know, we're not going to catch everything, but catch as much as we can at low, as low cost as we possibly can out of the chute. Dr. Lewis, uh, BIH is bioidentical hormone therapy. Dr. Carter is an expert on that. I, I was told by Jody that he doesn't do that. My, uh, Michael, do you, do, you, you do consults on hormones, right? Michael? So someone asked about uh, a family member to go with our service, which option is best for RA? So you can just do our basic testing right now on our main website. 
either the COVID panel, the COVID panel is just a more robust set of biomarkers or the chronic disease temperature, either one. Um, but there's an example of a gentleman who we really changed. And what he said is before I couldn't even bend my fingers. Now I can make a fist. Now I'm able to play with my grandkids and I'm not in pain anymore. Okay. So there's an example of what you can do. It took us about six months, as you can see, five months for this to occur. So I think we have a pretty good fix on RA. But the first thing I'm going to do with anybody with RA is get them, understand their mouth and get an oral DNA test because high correlation to that. So um, let's see. I'm just trying to see if I can find Dr. Carter, but um, so let's see what else we have for chats. Only 47. Looks like it's an interesting topic. Um, sadly, in the ingredients, yeah, we talked about that. Wow. Uh, yeah. Martha pointed out all the ingredients. But I think you can make it. But then again, look at the results. So it's like, there's no free lunch. I mean, can you avoid drinking in glyphosate or being exposed to it when you're outside? So we're all going to be exposed to some things that aren't necessarily the things we want to be exposed to, but the dose makes the poison. Anyway, how much of the povidone iodine, iodine do you add to the water pick? So it's been um, trial and error for me, but I add enough that the solution is dark brown. I'm not even measuring it. The other thing is though, if you spray the water flosser and it's foamy, you've added too much because we want a good strong jet. So, you know, what is the antiseptic level? Any iodine is going to have some level of antiseptic properties. So I want to maximize that, but also make sure you have a strong jet. So you just play with it. I basically just take a couple squirts of my povidone iodine bottle. And I'm putting in, you know, maybe um, four milliliters, something like that. Uh, Question. Um, what are you doing, though, to the uh, production of nitrous oxide and things like that? Not sure I know the answer to that question. Because, you know, uh, you talk about peroxide and mouthwash you know those are all highly not recommended uh we stay because... away we stay away from mouthwashes that are, are antibacterial yeah you know, coconut oil you know look at that as a food um doing some of this oxy rinse once in a while if you especially if you test positive you have recession mm -hmm. I think that would be a worthwhile thing to do but you can certainly try all these other things, but I think peroxide is the most deleterious because of its very strong, broad spectrum anti-organism effects. Yeah, and that's one of the problems with whitening toothpaste. Uh, you know, oh, it destroys yeah. the nitrous oxide production, which is now uh, apparently determined to be very, very important to overall health. Um, and I'm wondering about iodine and things like that, but co certainly coconut oil, salt, things like that would probably not not impact that well you know iodine is a natural substance too i mean we have to get iodine to and and i can guarantee you if you take it in as iodide your body will convert some to iodine it's not just uh things aren't static in your body so i think it's a, a fairly natural substance at in the milligram range in your body low 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 single digit milligram but still but still there so you know it's 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 always a it's always a battle. I mean, if you have um, you know if, if you have a severe infection and you're going septic, you're going to get antibiotics. It's a risk. Yeah. There's a risk benefit along the continuum, no matter what we're, no matter what you're talking about. You know, too much water. A friend of mine won the national championships in in cycling, and he um, he went into a you know electrolyte deficiency and nearly died by drinking too much water. 
So it's like there's no there's no free lunch anywhere. Uh, thank, thank you. So we have uh, Joyce says biotech has an oral switch based on hypochlorous acid. We'd love to understand how this compares with the dioxirins. See, you know, you you can certainly try that, Joy. But see, Robert's meticulous at recording things, so it's not anecdotal at least in his case, and I think it could be non-anecdotal for other people. But I think um, the hypochlorous acid is on the spectrum of what you're getting from the dioxin. So I think you're getting chlorous acid, which is a slightly more muscular cousin of um, the hypochlorous acid. So, yeah, I mean, Judy brings up the point of swallowing it. I mean, you might absorb a little teeny bit, but we got to have faith in our body to, to be able to detoxify from some of these things. Um, when water flossing three times a day, it is, is it with water only? Hmm. I, he, he mentions how often he does the povidone once a week, maybe puts some salt in there occasionally, but you know, if you're, oh, my, my, my gentleman that did six days a week was just uh, six times a day was, was just using um, water. So how do you deal with spirochetes? I think we answered that. Um, yeah, and, and you're right. I mean, there is sublingual, um, there is sublingual uh, absorption. And I think hypochlorous acid is certainly a way to go once a week with a povidone. Uh, you know, fluoride is um, more common than we think in pharmaceuticals because sometimes they'll use fluoride to make a new molecule that otherwise had a hydrogen there so they can patent it. So you'd be surprised where, where fluoride sh should show up. What about biocidin? He didn't use that. I think I think essential oils would be brilliant. Um, I'm just presenting something that is, you know, Dr. Stark that actually has uh, has results to talk about. So that's why I'm uh, on this bandwagon. Yes, I understand, Judy, with a CPAP. I, I have a I have a theory on that, but I'm not going to tell you because uh, I don't want you to stop using it because of me. <laughs> and with that, we're at the top of the hour. And as usual, I think I saw Dr. Harshfield on that is going to land the plane. Are you out there? Dave? I am. I am. <clears throat> um, I think this is, this is a great topic. I think we've sort of brushed on this topic before. We talked about voltages healing with Dr. Tennant's work and how important the teeth are. As an embryo, every one of our teeth are in a circuit. And for instance, your wisdom teeth. If you have trouble with your wisdom teeth, the circuit that that disrupts, it's like a circuit breaker when you have a problem. Each of your 32 teeth have got a specific uh, function. And when you have an abnormality of that tooth, then you can back into a systemic problem they may have. The spleen, pancreas, stomach uh, circuit and adrenal gland is affected by our wisdom teeth. I'll just take that for an example. That's everyone's familiar. Um, starting in the 60s, we started noticing a craniofacial disproportion. The faces of humans started getting smaller. Mm -hmm. And teleologically, this should take millions of years. This started happening. We started looking at what is going on here and, and what they trace it to is little kids having these infections, ear infections, throat infections, so forth. And it stunted the maturation development of the face. It also was complicated by the fact that we didn't breastfeed as much. And with breastfeeding, it develops the hard and soft palate in the jawbone. So then we started seeing people with TMJ, temporal mandibular joint issues. And we treat those all the time now. It'd be nicer to see it in a kid, but often we'll see older adults that have big muscular masseter muscles. And we can use Botox to weaken those muscles so they don't grind their teeth at night. These are all sort of stopgap procedures we have to do after the fact. 
a lot of the dental issues start, I think Steinemann several decades ago, uh, discovered that substances move through the body through the pulp chamber. And if you look at a tooth, it's got thousands of miles of small little tubules in the teeth. And the odontoblasts, which are your stem cells in your teeth, are pumping fluid. So your interstitial fluid, and that's what Dr. Lewis is teaching us, by what we eat and so forth, what we're doing is maximizing the potency of our interstitial fluid, which can then be pumped into the cell intracellularly or through tissues. And if it's healthy, the tooth, for instance, when the odontoblasts are working when you're a little kid, it's pushing fluid out, the, out of the teeth all the time. And some little thing will happen, even emotions. That's another discussion Amy Marsh will talk about. But certainly infections in the teeth or antibiotics, suddenly those odontoblasts stop pushing fluid out. Well, guess what? Bacteria start to come in. And that's sort of where it starts. And he you're proved this. You're doing brilliant. I'm just to interrupt, but Tom oh, sure. said the reason why fixing, particularly in kids, their, their bite, if you will, because if your bite is off, there can be a lot of pressure applied to specific teeth. Mm -hmm. and, and now, you know, you have a root canal next to that thing and you're literally, it's a pump. You're, you're pumping the fluid below the gum line at the root into the CNS, central nervous system fluid and the bloodstream. So bite is very important. So you're not, uh, you're not pumping the toxins into your, into your bloodstream. I think that our, our biologic, true biologic dentist, they're looking at, when they look at you, they go, okay, here we go. <laughs> Got to get rid of these root canals, all these issues right now. But what they're going to do today is going to be predicated on what we're going to do down the road. They all draw a roadmap to Dr. Lewis's point. Your dentition, you've got a bunch of opposing teeth and they need to play together. And these aren't correctly positioned. So we're going to develop your bite. It's going to take a year or two, again, log linear, so that you don't have these abnormal forces when you're biting. And we're going to stop the, the grinding of the teeth at night. So really good biologic dentists, Thomas, to your point, they're looking down the road. They go, okay, here, here we are today. we got to fix this stuff. You need a dentist that's thinking long-term, not just playing whack-a-mole. Um, anyway, that's probably more than you want to hear. But uh, I just think it's important to kind of think about why teeth uh, stop pushing fluid outward. And it's generally because, like in kids, they may have an oral infection. Here's another thing that happens. Emotions are tied to your teeth. And these kids that are having emotional disturbances when they're young, that affects the electricity in, in some of these teeth. And you add that to maybe a chipped tooth or they get trauma or something like that. Suddenly now we're starting to understand how important those 32 bones that the medical profession gave away, because I guess we didn't want to deal with them. But we got we to gotta grasp that. We got to get them back into the corral, start taking care of these teeth. They're very important. Right. And you know, Absorption from the gut, microbiome plays a major role in getting raw materials there. You know, why do pregnant women crave a pickle? Get some more acid in your gut. Now the, now these athletes, particularly these long endur endurance athletes, are chugging a little chip pickle juice along the route because they're emptying out their stomach and they want to get some acidity back so they can absorb the nutrients to keep them going. So micronutrients are at the core of almost everything. And there was a really great point in the question raised about why aren't we testing for micronutrients? Because I think the solution is improve gut and improve nutrient density, and then you'll probably be okay. And there'll be cases that that won't be completely true, but I bet you one of those two are still slightly off. So that, that's kind of our philosophy on that. So rebuilding, you, you can rebuild teeth. I mean, Josh Axe has published on this, um, you know, he talked about it anecdotally, but others have, you know, it's just tissue and you create a, a pressure to, in raw materials to rebuild enamel with the right things that will rebuild. If you can insert fluoride into your teeth, you can insert indigenous, you know, more, more common uh, nutrients in, into your enamel as well.
So. With that, I know there are tons of questions. It looks like this is an important topic <laughs> and we will um, endeavor to, to take it up further. Um, but I, I will publish this. I think there are other, so I think, I think the chlorous acid is a good alternative to the, you know, the, uh, the oxy rinse that you can make on your own. And Dr. Harshville is an expert on that. And we did publish in our blog how to make his formula for making um, hypochlorous acid. So I think that would be a good alternative. If anybody wants to measure their recession and uh, help us understand before and after whether it worked or didn't, I think that'd be very helpful. So oral is that important. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Bye now.